Good morning, brothers. It's good to be uh, with you. Good to hear the noise of uh, you greeting each other. And uh, I do think, well, I do, I'm pretty sure after talking with the team yesterday, uh, we were disappointed that the wall is broken and we're going to have to figure out how to, uh, to, one, get it taken down, and two, uh, it's an expensive replacement. But uh, we'll, we'll pray that the Lord provides the money for that. Um, sorry we're being crunched this, uh, this morning, um, but uh, we'll have the full room next week, I'm pretty sure. That said, too, I know that there are some, some of you who are new to Amen, and we are grateful that you are here. And just want to say, if you have friends who aren't here, haven't signed up, um, there's still time to invite. I, you can join Amen at any point. Uh, you don't have to necessarily have been here from the very beginning. And again, we'll have, we'll have more room next week. It's funny that Lon said that about the inclement weather policy. I was asked several times yesterday afternoon, I was asked two questions. First questions I was asked, um, and these are by people that, didn't, that don't really know us, right? Uh, I mean, didn't know Amen Bible study. They know what happens. They said, uh, are you going to have Amen tomorrow? And then the, the other question they asked me is, in, is anybody going to show up? And my answer to both questions was exactly the same. I'm like, uh, yeah, you apparently don't know Amen. <laughs> like, we always have it, and they will show up. Uh, and you proved, you proved me right this morning. We are going to be looking this semester at what it really means to be a man and, and ultimately what it means to be God's man. And as we uh, said in the letter that we sent out to all of you and sent out to all the men in our church, that it is a confusing time right now because there really is um, this, these, these two kind of pendulum swinging sides where on one side <clears throat> you have the world that truly is confused about, about gender and sexuality um, and, and the confusion is actually causing uh, problems with, within, their, within their own circles to sort things out. Uh, on the other side, and, I, and I, I'm sad that this has happened, there have been places within uh, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in this uh, country where we've gone extra biblical on what it means to be a man. And we've tried to, to put labels on, on certain things about what a man is that is really beyond scripture and in some ways has been, uh, ended up with being abusive. Um, and what we've got to do is to navigate from scripture what it truly, what God truly intended uh, when he created us male and female. Um, I want to give a quick orientation before we get into the text this morning. You'll notice that you have in the first part of your notebook um, not a complete syllabus, uh, we know, uh, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we'll have all those texts. Um, but as Barton and, and I particularly have, have gone back and forth, um, we haven't finally concluded on some of those texts um, because there's several great texts that we could, we could use. Uh, but we want to get those to you and, and we'll get those added in a more complete syllabus. And then if you turn to this page that says beliefs and definitions, I just thought, uh, Barton and I really thought it was important as we begin this particular study to make sure you all knew the context from which we're teaching. I'm not asking, I'm not saying when I say, you know, these are the beliefs we hold this, I'm not saying that necessarily you hold these beliefs or that you even need to. I'm not asking you to. I might want to convince you of it. I just want you to understand as we teach uh, the context from which we are teaching. So a few of these things that I think are important First of all, number one, that the Bible is a true and fallible word of God, and won't read through that whole thing, but it says in the very end, the Bible is the supreme and final authority on all matters on which it speaks. God gave us his word primarily so that we would understand who he is and that we could be saved. So it is not, the Bible doesn't speak on every subject, um, but it does give us a clear picture of how we can approach every subject. And so we want to be careful that what we're drawing from Scripture is what it says, not what we want it to say. And then we move into culture and into our lives from the, from the context of Scripture. Uh, number two, men and women are created by God and in the image of God. And on this basis, all people must be treated with dignity, honor, love, and respect. At the same time, um, in their quest for independence and the centrality of self, all people, like all of us, 
begin their lives alienated from God and in this condition are without hope and under a judgment, a condition that can only be cured through God's loving, gracious, saving intervention. As the image of God, we are most alive when our trust, affections, and allegiances center on him. That's important for us to recognize here, number one, that all of us in this room are broken sinners and we needed a savior. That we, and it wasn't because we were smarter than the other guy that we came to know Jesus. We came to know Jesus because Christ in his mercy and grace opened up our blindness and broke through our hard hearts so that, so that we could see him and we could know that he loved us. And so when we look at the men around us in our, in our, in our schools, in our workplace, uh, in our neighborhoods, in the city, uh, we understand that, that all of them are created in the image of God and that all of them uh, uh, deserve that dignity and that all of them, ultimately, like us, need a Savior. And so we want to be careful as we, as we navigate these, these issues of what it means to be a man and even get into the issues of gender and sexuality. We want to be careful that we don't puff ourselves up um, because maybe we don't struggle with what, what the next guy struggles with. I think that's very, very important. Number three, the Bible teaches that God intentionally created us male and female, and therefore there is a beautiful God-glorifying purpose in this. Uh, you'll see those definitions we'll get to at the bottom, and I just, I, I, those definitions are there so that we can speak clearly about these things. But I want you to know that we're coming from a context of teaching that we believe that God intended to create male and female, that there is a purpose in that, and that uh, as we understand that, we're going to understand God better, we're going to understand His created humanity better. Um, so that'll be not a specific lesson. That'll be something that's woven through everything that we're doing here. Number four, the Bible teaches that there are complementary roles for men and women in the church and home. I know that this is a debated topic even within the church. I just want you to know that as uh, Barton and George and myself teach, we're coming from that theological perspective. We actually think that the Bible clearly teaches that there's complementary roles for men and women in the church and the home. Um, I don't think, by the way, <laughs> I don't think those things necessarily apply to the workplace. Um, in other words, I have, I have no issue at all with working for a woman CEO. I don't think that's a, I don't think that's a, that's where you, you start to go extra biblical when you think that God doesn't allow that. Um, but I do think there's complementary roles within the church and home. Number five, God's truth must be taught both courageously and compassionately. And I hope that's what we do here at Amen. Um, we want to speak the truth, and sometimes those are hard truths, but we want to do it with compassion in the same way that Christ has moved towards us. Number six, we are all born with a broken sexuality, and we all need the forgiveness of our gracious Savior and the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit in us. I think that's really important for us to understand. On the spectrum of heterosexual to homosexual and everything in between, I do think we need to understand that everybody on that spectrum is born broken sexually. And that the opposite, for instance, the opposite of homosexuality is not heterosexuality. The opposite of homosexuality is holiness. And the goal is not that we're more heterosexual. The more is, goal is that we're more like Jesus. Now that plays into our sexuality, okay? I, it, it, there's, there's something there for us, and we're going to study that. Um, but I want us to understand uh, that just because we don't struggle with certain sexual sins doesn't mean, oh, I'm good in that area. And I think we men know that. I think everybody in here, wherever, wherever you are in your journey with sexuality, you know your own brokenness. I know my own brokenness uh, in that. And I think it's important for us to recognize that what we need most, what we need most is the gracious forgiveness of our Savior for our sins and the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit to make us more and more like Jesus. That's, that's what we need the most in all of this. Now, some definitions that we're going to use in our teaching um, around these issues of gender. And again, I think all three of these things are connected that I have there on the paper for you. I think they, I think they all are connected to each other in what God designed in men and women. 
Okay, so I'm not separating these out because I, I think they need to be in different categories. I just think in today's culture, you have to be clear with what you're talking about or it, it, it's a confusing conversation because other people think you're talking about. So when I, when I talk about biological sex, what I'm talking about is the, that what we're designed at birth by God most often made obvious by genitals and chromosomes. And I know there are rare example, uh, uh, exceptions to that, but overwhelmingly, <laughs> overwhelmingly, it's God who has designed what we are uh, in our biological sex. And, uh, and you know, you can, you can uh, put Todd Erickson in the ground, and 100 years from now, if Jesus doesn't come back and you uh, find Todd's bones and you run DNA tests on them, you're going to go, oh, he was a guy. <laughs> um, those things are kind of hardwired in us when it comes to biological sex. A sexual orientation is how I'm going to define this. The gender or genders to which one is sexually attracted. Okay, so that's what I mean. And again, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that there's not something regarding holiness that God is calling us to. I'm just saying... Uh, when I talk about sexual orientation, that's what I'm talking about. And then gender, I'm going to define gender as the expression of one's biological sex. This is impacted greatly by the social and cultural context in which one lives. So the expression of our biological sex is what I'm defining as, as gender, how, how, we, how we show we are men or women. And that is, I, I do think there's something from Scripture that is, that is hardwired in design when it comes to gender, um, and we'll, we'll get to some of that. But I also think we need to be honest and recognize that, that there is a pretty significant cultural and social impact about how gender is expressed in any place in history and in any location, right? I mean, we're not going to wear skirts, but if we had grown up in Scotland in the, in the 1600s, we might have worn some skirts, right? We just would have called them kilts. All, all I'm saying is there is an expression, but I do wonder from Scripture if there's not some things we can draw in regards to that expression that God designed in us as men, and we'll get to that. Anyways, I want you to have those definitions, um, and I want you to have those beliefs so you understand uh, what we're teaching, where we're teaching from. Also, if any questions come up, um, man, just shoot me an email or Barton an email or George an email, um, todd.erickson at 2pc.org, and I'd be happy to answer them, and if it needs more of a conversation, I'd love to grab a coffee with you or grab lunch with you, or grab breakfast with you and talk about those things. Now, let's turn to Acts chapter 22 and begin uh, this series. Acts chapter 22, verses 1 uh, through 16 is where we're going to read. I need to give you the context for this, okay? We're going to be looking at Paul's conversion. So Saul, before he became a Christian, was persecuting Christians, and then the Lord grabbed a hold of him, broke through his darkness uh, to get a hold of him. And actually, in the book of Acts, the conversion of Paul is recorded in three places. Uh, it's recorded by Luke in the, in, as, as the history. Here's, what, here's when it happened in Acts chapter 9. And then in Acts chapter 22, Paul is sharing his testimony uh, in Jerusalem before this mob that was about to, about to beat him to death. And then in Acts chapter 26, um, Paul is sharing it in, in, the, in the court and he is sharing his testimony there. I chose to go to Acts 22 because in the, in the description that's described there, or the, the way it's, that Paul puts it there, I think it gives us the things that we really want to look at uh, this morning. But I am going to reference the chapter 26 one as well. And in this context, before we dive in here in verse, in verse 1 of 22, we need to understand that Paul has gone back to Jerusalem. And the reason he's gone back to Jerusalem after doing all these missionary journeys all over the, the Mediterranean basin, the reason he's gone back is because there's been this famine that has occurred in Israel. And remember, he was collecting, uh, he was collecting funds from the different churches uh, throughout uh, the Mediterranean basin as gifts to go back to Jerusalem and to help the Christians there because they were really struggling and suffering. And so he was bringing these monetary gifts. Now, he was told uh, several times and pleaded with, uh, they pleaded with him, please don't go back. If you go back there, you're going to get arrested. Um, we, we just don't think you should go back and bring this gift. But Paul was intent, no, I need to go back. I feel the Lord is leading me uh, to do this. 
And they kept saying, listen, you're gonna, uh, it's going to be dangerous for you. You're, you. You might get killed. You're certainly going to face imprisonment. Paul actually said, I think I am. I think I might. I think I might uh, die there. I think, I, I think I'm going to face imprisonment. But you know what? That's what happened everywhere I went. <laughs> so I'm, I feel compelled by the Lord to go, and so that's what I'm going to do. And sure enough, he gets to Jerusalem. Uh, they recognize him there in the temple, and this mob literally starts beating him like this. That's the man who's turning people uh, against uh, the Jewish faith. That's the man um, who is taking this to the Gentiles. And, and the, the, the guard has to come in. Uh, the soldiers have to come in and rescue Paul from being beaten, but they're going to arrest him. And now they're taken away. And Paul says, hey, can you, can you just put me down? They're actually carrying him. <laughs> can you put me down and just let me speak to these people, to this mob? That's where we pick it up. In Acts chapter 22, verse 1. Brothers and fathers, this is Paul speaking. Brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I now make before you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, they became even more quiet. And he said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God as all of you are in this, in this day. I persecuted this way. That's the way they describe the Christian faith, the way. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women, as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness. From them, I received letters to the brothers, and I journeyed toward Damascus to take those also who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. As I was on my way and drew near to Damascus, about noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me, and I fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, rise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told of all that is appointed for you to do. And since I could not see because of the brightness of the light, I was led by hand by those who were with me, and I came into Damascus. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour I received my sight and I saw him, and he said, the God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear the voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to every one of what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Brothers, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I want us to see a couple things here as we begin this study on what does it mean to be God's man? What does it mean to be a man? And ultimately, what does it mean to be a man at the core of it is defined by who God is. It doesn't start with who we are. And it's interesting to note when you look at Paul's conversion, whether here or Acts 26 or Acts 9, it's interesting to note that Paul's conversion is not just a new belief system. It literally is a surrender. Paul's conversion is not just a, oh, okay, that's interesting. I'll take that under, under consideration. Yeah, I think that's right. I think I want to add that to my life. Now, Paul's conversion clearly is a surrender. Because you start by looking, as you see there uh, in our notes there, you see Paul is this man of the world, and he describes himself that way. He talks about it right here, even as he's talking to these Jewish people, about how he really is self-made. Like, he's a guy that has 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 educated himself, has done all the right things to be that guy in the world, a man of the world. And if you turn in your Bibles, and I'd love for you to do this, to Philippians chapter 3, you hear Paul describe this in another specific way. When he's writing to the, to the Philippian church, he says in Philippians chapter 3, I'll start with verse 3, For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God, and for the glory in Christ put no confidence in the flesh. Now he's going to say, let me tell you how much confidence I could have just as a man of the world. 
Verse 4, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. That's, some, that's a serious lineage right there. A Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. And Paul makes it clear no, I, I, did, I did this all exactly right. And I know for all of us, there is something admirable <laughs> when you see a guy like that. And I know that there's a, there's a desire for a lot of us to go, yeah, I want to be that guy. I want to be that guy that made all the right decisions, that went to all the right schools, that made, that, you know, that, that made all the right moves in life to have that kind of pedigree, uh, to be respected in this city, to be respected among my friends as someone who kind of is self-made. And there's a real temptation even for us, isn't it, as Christian men, to lean into that, to, to, to seek respect because of what we've accomplished, because of what we've pulled off. I remember, uh, I don't know if this occurred in your family, but in my family with my, grand, my, my praise the Lord, my grandfather, my great-grandfather, um, they, were, they were Christians. Uh, I just think that sometimes the churches they went to didn't, didn't teach a depth. Uh, Don prayed for a depth, and I think they knew the Lord and knew he was a Savior, but there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of depth there because I, I kept hearing about verses in the Bible that actually weren't in the Bible, right? Like these sayings that they would say, well, you know, the Bible says, da-da-da-da. And I'm like, I don't, I've never read that, Grandpa, you know? Um, and one of them I used to hear a lot is, you know, the Bible says God helps those who help themselves, and I'm like, yeah, that doesn't sound right. You know, like, um, and there were other ones like that. But I think that comes out of that idea of, you know, to, to, to be an American man is to be a guy who has, who has been self-made. Paul says, hey, I'm, I was self-made. Not only that, verses 4 and 5 of chapter 22 of Acts, he was self-driven. And that's what he said when he talks about it. Um, I persecuted this way, the Christian faith, I persecuted them to death. I was passionate and committed. I was so committed, I got letters from the Sanhedrin to basically go, you know, letters of extradition to, to go up to Damascus. And I was going to find other people, other Jews who were infiltrating the uh, synagogues with this false teachings about Jesus. And I was going to arrest them. I got permission from the Sanhedrin to arrest them and bring them back and put them in prison in Jerusalem. I mean, this guy was absolutely committed to what he was doing. He was driven. And isn't that something we look at sometimes and go, gosh, that guy is really driven. I wish I were as driven as that guy. You know, I wish I'd, I wish, I, yeah, I've had some crazy ideas of what should happen in business, but man, that guy actually went, went for it. He decided he was, he was going to go after it and accomplish it. Isn't there a true, a, a temptation that if I'm going to be a man, that what it means to be a man is I need to be self-made and I need to be driven. I need to have that, that drive. And I'm not saying that there's anything necessarily inherently sinful in these two things. I'm just saying this is not how the Bible defines manhood. This is not the core of what we should be. There's something much more important. So we look at that, self-made, self-driven. I know some of us in here, um, some, of you, some, of you, some of you guys, you succeeded at that. You know, my brother, I have one brother, he's five years younger than me, and uh, he's a perfectionist, a successful perfectionist. Um, I am what they call a frustrated perfectionist. <laughs> I wanted those things to work out. My brother, it worked out. I remember one time we, uh, we had to share a, a room. That was not pleasant for me, mostly because on Saturday mornings when it was time to clean up the room, Mark's side of the room was already clean because the guy from birth lived organized, right? Right? So for him, it took him five minutes to put like two things away. My side of the room was going to take like hours, hours to fix. And my little brother used to stand at the doorway and then say, hey, I, I think you missed something over here. Hey, you missed something over here. And I was like, you better, you're, you better go in the other room or you're going to be missing a face. Um, he was a, uh, he, uh, but you know, I, some of you, some of you just by personality, by, by how you grew up, man, you did succeed. Some of us in here are like Todd. You're like, yeah, 
I wanted to be that guy, but I'm not that guy. Well, what is the starting point for being a man of God? What is the core? The core is not being self-made. It's not being self-driven. The core is what comes next. It's interesting to note uh, here when we talk about what it means to be a man of God um, that in Saul's conversion, there's one other thing that Christ said to him besides, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And this is really important for us. If you look over to just a couple pages to Acts 26, when Paul describes uh, or or gives his testimony at that point, Acts chapter 26, and uh, let's look at, uh, start at verse 12. Paul says this, In this connection I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and the commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when I had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in Hebrew, the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. That's an interesting statement. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. We don't use that statement because most of us aren't farmers with oxen pulling a you know, plow. But if we were, in order to keep the ox in the right direction, you would have a goad, a sharp stick, which would, which would kind of poke on one side of the ox or poke on the other side of the ox to get it going and to keep pushing and pulling. Sometimes the ox, irritated with this pointy thing that was jabbing him in the backside, would, would kick at it which of course was absolutely useless. <laughs> he wasn't going to get it, and probably he was going to get a little more goad if he was stopping to just kick against the goads. What is Jesus saying to Paul? Jesus is saying, it's been hard for you, hasn't it, Paul, to kick against my prodding? I think what we're seeing here is not that there was this sudden moment for Paul, but that in this moment on the way to Damascus was the culmination of some prodding that God had been doing along the way in, in Paul's life. And probably in your own conversion, you'd be able to say, yeah, I, I know that. What were, what, were, what, were Paul's, what were God's goads for Paul? One of them is interesting to think about. Paul was, Paul was almost, it, it looks like he was almost exactly the same age as of Jesus Christ. And Paul grew up in Jerusalem and was in the court of the Pharisees. It, it, it's highly, highly probable that Paul heard firsthand Jesus teach. It's highly probable uh, that, that Paul at least knew of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus, again, if not actually having seen him face to face. And I wonder if there was some internal doubt in this man's mind about whether or not Jesus of Nazareth really was the Son of God. Not only that, you remember when you read earlier in Acts at the stoning of Stephen, the first martyr, that the men who threw the stones laid their coats at the feet of a man named Saul. Saul was there. So Saul would have heard Stephen say in that moment as he's being put to death, I see the Christ high and lifted up. And then hear Stephen say, please forgive them for what they're doing. I just wonder if one of the goads for Paul was this internal intellectual doubt about maybe, maybe I'm not right. Maybe this Christ thing is for real. I think I, I wonder if another goad for Paul was this tension he must have had between tradition, the Old Testament, and traditionalism, all the things that came along with the Jewish faith. And so there was tradition, which was the word of God coming from what we now hold as the Old Testament. But remember, the Pharisees decided to add a whole lot of traditionalism to that. So they had all these patterns and rules that they said, this is what reflects what's in Scripture. And I wonder if there was, an, there was a wrestling there for Paul that was, a, that was a goad for him. I wonder what the goads were that drove you to Christ or that are driving you to Christ. Um, I know even in our culture in the South, sometimes I think tradition and traditionalism can get confused. 
And that's where I think we've messed up sometimes in our church when we've gotten extra biblical because we've decided that this expression is the only way these scriptures can be lived out. And I just think we need to look again. It may be true. It may be true. But I think we need to, we need to go from traditionalism and look at scripture and say what it has, and see what it has to say. Uh, the goads. Paul, Paul, Christ was, was working on him. And finally, it led to this surrender. And in this surrender, I want us to see quickly in the time that we have left, these three things. First of all, in Paul's surrender, it led in him to some new questions. And I love these two questions in Acts chapter 2. Two questions, verse 8, first, who are you, Lord? Verse 10, what shall I do, Lord? Who are you, Lord? you got to know, and, I'm, and, and these two questions, I'm telling you, these two questions are questions, brothers, that should frame our lives as men. I think the starting point for even knowing what it means to be a man, and I don't just mean be a man of God. I mean be a man because God created us male and female. And in order for us to understand what God intended in his created humanity, in order for us to understand why did he create us male and female, it starts with us surrendering our own ideas about what it means in culture uh, to, to be a man and surrendering all of our own ideas of what it means to, to have identity and to have purpose, to surrender it to the Savior and to start with these two questions and to have these two questions always frame who we are. And the first one is, who are you, Lord? Knowing Christ. I love what Don's prayer, some of you men have been in here for over two decades and you know what the reason you're here is what Don prayed. We never in this life, we never stop learning and seeing who Christ is. We could spend a hundred years on this planet and we will, we will never exhaust who Christ is. And so to, to be a man, we have got to know who Christ is. That's why I commend all of you who are here, whether you're, whether you're in your, your teens or you're in your 90s, because we need to be here every morning because the starting point of what it means to be a man begins with who Christ is. Who are you, Lord? And then the second question, and what shall I do, Lord? <laughs> what do you want me to do? Not what do I want to do? You know, we, uh, even as Christian men, we, we have a tendency to to kind of do this when it comes to what are we going to do with our lives. We think, gosh, I really like this. I want to do this. I want to study here. I want to work in this business. i got a business plan I've worked out here. Um, I'm going to be a teacher. Uh, you know, I'm going to go into nonprofit. I'm a, you know, and man, and I'm, these are all coming from my desire to serve Christ. And so we map out this plan and we write it out and we, we take it to the Lord and we're like, Lord, here's the plan Here's, here's what I really want to do with my life or my business or my teaching or, you know, in, and here's, this is, this is my plan. If, if, Lord, if you, could just, uh, if you could just sign down right here and uh, bless this plan. Please bless my plan. And here's what I think the Lord does to us when we're, when we're listening. He's like, yeah, okay, that's, that's great, Todd. Uh, listen, I got a paper for you. If you could, Todd, just go ahead and sign down here. And you're like, yeah, but, it, I, but Lord, it's blank. I would, yeah, yeah just, just go ahead and sign, Todd. <laughs> yeah, but Lord, you haven't, I, I need to know what, no, no, you just go ahead and, and sign. And you're like, yeah, but Lord, this plan looks very Christian, doesn't it? You know, like, Lord says, Todd, just sign, sign right here. That's what's happening here. Literally, Literally, Paul is giving up everything. He's giving up everything. Who are you, Lord? And what shall I do, Lord? New questions. The surrender for Paul also led to a new mission. See in verses 12 through 15 that he's led to Ananias, right? And Ananias says, hey, let me tell you what's gonna, what's, what you're going to do. This is what God has for you. God is gonna, has given you this vision. God is going to give you his will, and you are going to be the one who is going to be uh, his messenger. And this is your new purpose in life. 
How radically different is that? I mean, this is a guy who was a Jew of Jews, a Hebrew of Hebrews. This is a guy who was a Pharisee. And it's not like God says, hey, listen, you know, just go into woodworking or, you know, you're a tent maker. Just just go into tent making. Do some of that. Kind of tone down all this other stuff and start going to some Bible studies with Ananias and, you know, you'll, you'll be good. Just get... No, he's like, no, no, Paul, you actually, um, you didn't realize this, but you're, it's not just Damascus you're going to go to and travel to. We're going to have you travel all over the world and you're going to teach people <laughs> about this Christ whom you're persecuting. I mean, it is a radical change in his life. And now instead of being self-driven, he's now God-driven. And he's surrendered to that. He's trained his whole life for this. And God says, yeah, I'm going to use some of that. Like you've studied and memorized lots of the Old Testament. Paul, that's going to be helpful. It was my plan all along you do that. But now here's how you're going to use it. And this is your new mission in life. Paul was worried about that mission because he's like, man, they're not going to believe me. And some people didn't. Some people didn't want to go near him because they're like, I think it's a trick. But again, Paul surrendered to this. He had this new uh, mission and he had had given himself completely to it. And then lastly, a new identity. Look at what it says in verse 16. I love, uh, <laughs> I love the way Ananias starts it. And why now do you wait? Like, let's get going. What are you waiting for, man? Keep going. It reminds me of uh, in Acts chapter 2, um, when Jesus uh, is, or Acts chapter 1, when Jesus ascends into heaven. And it says that, that he's there on the Mount uh, of Olives and uh, he tells him, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and to the ends of the earth. And then they saw him uh, ascend into heaven, the, the disciples to the apostles. And they're just standing. And they're, as it says, as they were standing there staring, suddenly an angel appeared and basically said to him, what are you staring at? <laughs> he gave you a mission. Don't hang out here. Go do it. Ananias says to him, hey, why are you waiting? And then he says, verse 16 of Acts chapter 22, rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. This is a bigger deal than you think because this really was an issue of identity. Baptism was and is a public moment. And included in that moment when you're adult is this statement, Jesus is Lord. So Paul was going to have to go in front of people and be baptized into the way. And in doing so, stand and publicly confess, Jesus is Lord. This man who had built his entire life around denying this was now totally surrendered in his identity to say, you know what my identity is? This is my identity. My identity is Christ, and that's it. He expresses this. Go back to what we read in, in Philippians chapter 3. He expresses this even more clearly in Philippians chapter 3. So we had read um, in verses uh, 4 through 6, um, you know, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. Uh, uh, I was a Pharisee. I was a persecutor of the church. I was blameless. And then look at verse 7 of Hebrews, of, excuse me, of Philippians 3. Philippians 3 verse 7. Paul writes this, but whatever gain I had, I counted a loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I counted everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, counting them as rubbish. That literally is a slang word for manure. Or maybe another word that I probably shouldn't say since this is being recorded. Paul says, I counted my accomplishments, my education, my self-madeness, my drivenness, I counted it as a pile of manure in order that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I might know him. Who are you, Lord? That I might know him and the power of his resurrection, and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. What shall I do, Lord? Becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. 
He says, listen, that's who I was. That was my identity. I had built it and I had worked hard at it. But I counted that as a pile of manure compared to knowing Christ. And everything in my life is going to be defined by that. He writes in another place. I am crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. In the life I now live, I live by faith in the one who gave himself for me. Brothers, the starting point of what we need to be as men is that. I am thankful for those of you in here who have great jobs. I'm thankful that you have that. I'm thankful for the way the Lord has provided for all of us. I am thankful for for the families he's given us. I'm thankful for the things that he's allowed you to accomplish. But all of that is a pile of rubbish compared to knowing Jesus. And if we're going to be men as God created in this culture, that's where it's got to start. That's where it's got to start. A friend of mine who used to say, I am a disciple of Christ cleverly disguised as a physical therapist. (laughs) And I would say to you, even as a pastor, (laughs) I'm a disciple of Christ cleverly disguised or maybe not so cleverly disguised (laughs) as a pastor. Whatever you are, the core of your identity and I, you know, I'm in this, let's just talk about our broken sexuality. Um, actual, real statistics that you can believe, not the puffed up ones that I think are, are, are culturally driven and are not accurate, and, and honestly not ones that are coming just whimsically off of Google. But the actual scientific uh, 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 facts around this is that in a room like this, um, it, is, it is normal that 7% of us would have at some point in our lives had some homosexual thoughts or struggled with, with homosexuality, same-sex attraction. And 1% would be exclusively same-sex attracted. And that's just, that's just a reality. There's some great men uh, in, in our church who struggle uh, with same-sex attraction and yet walk in absolute obedience to Jesus uh, in the purity of their lives. And they're my heroes because, sadly, there's a lot of heterosexual men (laughs) who, uh, in, in our church even, who are not walking in obedience in their heterosexuality, but instead looking at porn and, and even engaging in extramarital relationships. But here's why I bring all that up. Our sexuality is not our identity. Our identity is Jesus. Ultimately, our gender is not our identity. Our identity is Jesus. We we learn who we are. And we learn how we should conduct ourselves We learn who we were created to be as men. We're redeemed as men when we begin with an absolute surrender and say, I am a child of the King. I am a disciple of Christ, cleverly disguised as however you want to put it. Brothers, as we begin this series, I would ask you to ponder this question in your lives this week. Have you surrendered everything to Christ? Have you surrendered everything to Christ? You're not holding anything back. Is your life framed by those new questions? Who are you, Lord? What shall I do, Lord? Is that what frames your days and your weeks? If we're going to reclaim true manhood, it's going to start with surrender. But man, when you surrender, you get to go on a journey that will blow your mind. Because the grace and the love and the forgiveness and the redemption of Jesus is magnificent. And when Paul said, I count all this as rubbish 
compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus my Lord, he wasn't trying to tough it out. He was literally saying, no, that's a pile of garbage compared to this. This is awesome. This is awesome. This is so awesome, I don't even like that anymore. (laughs) That's what's in store for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for these men who encourage my heart so much. Lord, on this uh, inclement weather day um, with schools closed, that these men would be here to sit under your word, Lord, humbles me and reminds me that I too must sit under your word. Father, we are here with a desire to surrender everything to you, but it is our inclination, Father. It is It is our struggle to hold on to things and to not surrender. And Father, each of us, each of us in this room have certain things that that we know we have not turned over to you. Oh, Father, give us the grace to surrender everything. Lord, in this culture, we know that men and women, even in our own homes, are desperate to see what it is you designed when you designed us male and female, what it is when you designed and gave us the image of God. And Father, though we are broken and sinful, you are the Redeemer who brings that great restoration. And so we pray that you would do that through us, even as we study your word this semester. Lord, that you might be glorified in our lives, that we might be filled with joy, that we might be filled with purpose, that we might be filled with with courage, with compassion. Lord, that we might reflect exactly what it is you want us to be as your dearly loved sons. Pray this in Jesus' name and all God's men said, Amen. Amen.